So uh, do turn with me to Colossians chapter 1 and begin to read verse 9 on page 1182. Paul writes, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we do acknowledge what a great privilege and joy it is to come before you this morning. And Lord, to be amazed that you, in your greatness, nonetheless will do care about each one of us and will speak to each one of us. And so we ask, dear Lord, that the same Holy Spirit who breathed out these words we've just read earlier will breathe into our hearts those wonderful truths to change us, to enable us to walk more closely with our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, please do be seated and uh, do turn to that reading from Colossians chapter 1. Now, one of the uh, many rewarding things gained through working through Tim Chester's One True Story over Advent is the use of the different prayers which occur at the end of each meditation. And uh, some of these prayers are really, really wonderful. And I have been particularly blessed and moved by the prayers of Henry VIII's last wife, Catherine Parr, because they are so deep and rich and just infused with Scripture. But of course, not everyone can attain such heights in prayer. And uh, this is a prayer I came across a while ago which might resonate a little more closely with most of us. And it goes like this. Dear Lord, so far today I'm doing all right. I've not gossiped, lost my temper, been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or self-indulgent. I've not whined, complained, or eaten any chocolate. I've not charged my credit card. However, I'm going to get out of bed in a few minutes, <laughs> and I'll need a lot more help after that. Amen. Now, we can learn an awful lot about a person from the way they pray. We discover where their spiritual priorities lie, what moves them, what makes them tick. And in some ways, listening in on a prayer is like listening in on any conversation. It provides a glimpse into the nature of the relationship. In this case, the relationship between a Christian and God. How they communicate to God reveals to some degree the quality of that relationship. Is it deep or shallow? Is it formal or familiar? But also listening in to someone who really does know how to pray, that is to pray as the Bible tells us how we should pray, then, of course, we can learn how to pray too. And if you want to know how to pray biblically and what to pray for, then you would be very hard-pressed to find a better passage than the one we're looking at this morning in Colossians chapter 1, other than the one we were looking at the other night in Philippians 1. You see, as Paul opens his heart to these young believers, we're left in no doubt whatsoever what motivates and shapes his praying. It is the gospel. In fact, there are four aspects of Paul's prayer life which flow out from the good news of Jesus Christ and which should also characterize our praying. First, there is gospel gratitude. Did you notice how Paul begins his praying with thanksgiving? 
because of the way God's message of the gospel actually saves people. It's there earlier in verse 3. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. Because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all of God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have also heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. And so, in the light of that, Paul goes on to say in verse 9, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. Now, you've got to bear in mind, Paul has never met these people. But that doesn't matter. Yes, they were converted through one of their own, someone called Epaphras. But you see, all Paul needs to know is that they're Christians. And that is sufficient for him to commit himself to praying for them. Did you notice what he says? He's never stopped praying for them. So whenever he sets time aside to come before God, these believers are in his mind's eyes. He lifts them before the heavenly throne. There's this close link between thankfulness and prayerfulness. In his great kindness, God has saved these folk through the gospel. And Paul is simply over the moon with that thought. The gospel fruit is sprouting up everywhere in the Lycus Valley where these folk are situated. And this gospel activity on God's part is matched by, God's, uh, by gospel prayer on Paul's part. So this is one of the means God has already given whereby the gospel actually spreads and bears fruit, by people praying for it to do so. So we're not to complain to God if we don't see people being converted, if we're not praying that they will get converted. And so this gospel praying of Paul is not a matter of mere grind, but gratitude. Now, the great reformer, um, Martin Luther, would often quote the Latin proverb, nothing ages more quickly than gratitude. And sadly, we know that to be true, don't we? Think of what characterizes a new believer. Isn't it a sense of wonder of what's happened to them? Isn't it an astonishment that they have this remarkable, living, personal relationship with God? But by the same token, what is it that can so often characterize the older Christian? Sometimes it's cynicism. A sort of stoic pressing on which is lifeless and joyless. But Paul, you see, refuses to allow that to happen to him, and he does not want it to happen to these believers either. And so the way deep joy And fresh gratitude will be fed is by a constant reminder of what God has achieved by the gospel, as we see in verse 12. Giving joyful thanks to the Father, why? Who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light? For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now this is the miracle of miracles, that God, through the gospel message, is able to take people who are enslaved to sin and Satan, to set them free, and then to lift them and put them into an entirely different realm, a totally new dimension, the kingdom of light in which all sins are forgiven. So if in any measure you leave the gospel behind or you you, you downgrade it, then eventually you're going to leave joy behind. And so you're going to be tempted to substitute it with some cheap imitation. So let me tell you, True story about Ben. 
Now, Ben was a black cotton, uh, worked on a, on a cotton plantation in the Deep South during the early part of the 19th century. And he was born into slavery. He knew nothing else. He'd seen his father beaten. As a little boy, he'd seen his mother raped by the same man, the white plantation owner. And as he grew older, well, eventually he married. And he had three beautiful children. But as far as he was concerned, they were going to be slaves too. For Ben, it was one long, dark night, never day. And that darkness became all the more intense when the slave owner decided to sell off his wife and children to another plantation owner. And despite the desperate pleas from the children and the tears of his wife, Ben was powerless to do a thing. As they were dragged away and they were thrown onto the back of a wagon, never to be seen again. But then came the Civil War, a war which cost the lives of thousands yielded up in the bloodiest conflict the United States had ever known, with more Americans dying in that war than all subsequent wars the Americans have been involved in ever since. 600,000 dead out of a relatively small population. But then one day, the declaration was made. Freedom. A word that Ben may have thought of but would never, ever dare utter. He was free, together with countless other slaves. Free to find his wife and children. Free to choose his work. Free to walk the streets unmolested, at least in theory. Although it took another hundred years, more or less, for that to be worked out. Now, do you think, for a moment, that Ben would ever be short of praise and gratitude to Abraham Lincoln? Do you think that, as he reflected on those dark, lonely days as a slave, he'd ever want to go back to them and to live uh, uh, as if his newfound freedom was a kind of illusion? Of course not. Well, similarly... Christians are being set free from a far greater tyranny and a far deeper darkness and at far greater cost. A freedom purchased not by the blood of soldiers on the battlefield, but by the blood of God's Son on the cross. And just as Ben had to learn to adjust and use his newfound freedom of right and needed help in doing so, then Christians need to learn to adjust to their new freedom and to realize what is true of them. And so, they need praying for. Now, can I just pause for a moment there and ask whether you actually do that? We've got a number of uh, new believers here. Are you praying for them? More to the point, I guess, is are you praying this for them? because they need it. Which brings us to the second aspect of Paul's praying, which is gospel thinking, verse 9. We continually ask God to do what? To fill you with knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. Now, one of the uh, questions an earnest Christian will understandably ask is, what is God's will for my life? And often it's a question which arises out of right motives. You want to please the one who saved you. And some folk do come up with the strangest answers to that kind of question. Uh, there was one man who was quite convinced that God's will for him was to work as a missionary in South America. And so he told this as to his Christian friend who gently inquired, why South America of all places? Well, he explained I'd been, he'd been eating a, a, a chocolate bar while he was praying. And he suddenly realized that the chocolate bar was filled with Brazil nuts. And he took this as a sign of God's guidance. 
His friend's only thought was, well, thank goodness it wasn't a Mars bar. <laughs> now, that's not the kind of guidance, uh, the, the, of knowledge of God's will that Paul's praying for here. It's something much more important, much more down to earth. Actually, the way this verse could be translated is asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will which consists of all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now, in the Bible, spiritual wisdom is that ability to apply what you believe to day-to-day -day life, to have that discernment to do the right thing at the right time in the right way. In other words, to engage in right thinking about God, about Jesus, about the world, which then enables us to live rightly in the world. That is what Paul is praying for, for these Christians. Now, it is so important that we appreciate the place of the Christian's mind in all of this. You see, wanting to be open to God's will is not a matter of feeling the goosebumps. Paul talks of knowledge. He talks of wisdom. He talks of understanding. And it's obvious, really, because if you're going to have a personal relationship with someone and ensure that that relationship grows, then you've got to know that someone. What are their likes and dislikes? What are their plans? What are their purposes? And you'll want to know the sort of things which please them. And you'll want to avoid the kind of things which will upset them. Now, I, I remember um, buying my first birthday present for Heather soon after we started going out. And uh, being the incurable romantic I am, I bought her a book of poems of Keats. I thought that's what girls wanted, you know. <laughs> and I never even bothered to find out whether she liked poetry. Uh, by, the, by the way, she doesn't. <laughs> but she sweetly accepted it anyway. Now, if I'd have bought her a book on compost, I might have got a bit <laughs> further, but, you know. Well, if we're going to please God then we've got to have knowledge of the kind of things which please him. We have to understand the basis of the nature of our relationship with him, which is not religious really works, but grace. And we have to have the wisdom to apply that knowledge. And all of that comes through the gospel, do you see? And the practical nature of this wisdom thinking Christianly, and so acting Christianly, is borne out by the third aspect of Paul's praying, which is gospel living. Verse 10. Why is Paul praying? He tells us, I, we pray this in order that you might live a life worthy of the Lord Jesus and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. There it is again. So do you see what Paul's goal is in, in praying? And what should ours be? It is not that we should have a quiet life. Peace, profit, prosperity. That's what the world wants, not what a Christian wants. No, this is what a Christian wants, to live a life worthy of the Lord. That is literally walking worthily of Jesus, pleasing him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work. And this is God's will for your life and mine, that we be different, that we be more like Christ. Now, you know, the Christian student, in principle, should be very, very different from the non-Christian student in very practical ways, such as handing in their assignments on time, producing work of good quality, Exhibiting a level of integrity and honesty which is perhaps not so commonly found amongst others. Now why? To please the tutor? To get a good grade? Not in the first instance. But to please Christ, you see. That's what he says. The Christian father, the Christian mother, should in principle be significantly different to their non-Christian counterparts. Why? Well, because they look at things differently. 
They see things differently through the lens of Scripture. They now have the wisdom, because of what the Bible teaches, that children aren't commodities which are just there for our pleasure. They are those made in God's image and so entrusted to our care. And so he goes on to the Christian doctor, the Christian teacher, and the Christian homemaker, the Christian shop worker. Because now they live, you see, as if, and it is true, that God is concerned with every aspect of their lives, that whatever it is they're doing, however great, however small, it is resulting, it is a fruit of good work. It is good and pleasing in God's sight. Now, that is why God has saved you if you are a Christian. Not simply that you can go to heaven when you die, but that you may glorify him on earth while you live. And when this happens, when this happens, it is so astonishing that non-Christians will sit up and take notice. Always do. There was a lovely Christian woman called Joyce Page. And uh, Joyce worked as a secretary in the office, uh, but every day she left her office at lunchtime and she took along with her a peanut butter sandwiches. And then she would visit a local prison involved in a uh, Christian uh, prison fellowship. Sometimes we have worship, a worship service, she says, or a time of testimony or singing or in-depth Bible study. And when she finished, goes back to the office and works till five. Now, I guess for many, meeting with prison inmates every day in the middle of a very hectic work schedule is simply too much of a chore. But Joyce sees things differently. For me, she says, it is a real answer to prayer. You see, I don't have time to go after work. I have six children which I am bringing up by myself. You see, bearing fruit in every good work means sharing Christ's love, even when it is inconvenient, even when it is tiring. And not surprisingly, Paul says, this leads on to a growing knowledge of God. So we're not to complain, you see, that we don't know God if we're ignoring his word, because the two of them work in tandem. The more you know of God, the more you will live a life pleasing to him. And the more you live a life pleasing to him, the more you will know of God. And the more you know of God, the more you will live a life pleasing to him. And it's a, a continuous circle. So it's not just a matter of, of, of stuffing our brains with Bible truths. It's putting those truths into practice. Now you say, well, this is a very tall order, and it is, and left by ourselves, it's plain impossible. And that's why Paul goes on to the fourth aspect of his prayer, praying for gospel power. Verse 11, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. So let me ask, where is God's power to be seen today? The big Christian jamboree? The odd miracle or two? Enthusiastic singing, maybe? No, no. The glorious might of God, which provides all power, is supremely found in Christians who are enduring and being patient. Now, that is a miracle. That you become a believer and you continue being a believer, come what may. And so difficult is this because of the opposition of the world and the flesh and the devil, that it takes nothing less than the whole power of God to sustain you. Now, when Paul speaks of Christians having great endurance and patience, the, the pictures of the kind of stamina and fortitude you need to, to get under a great weight like a log or a stone and to, to pick it up and to lift it and continue with it without dropping it. And you don't give up. Now, it has to be admitted that those kind of virtues are not that popular in our culture today. What is a representative drink 
of the affluent West, but champagne. Lots of fizz, giving you a pretty good buzz, but having no nutritional value for the long haul. We live in the age of the instant, not the age of the constant. And I've been a Christian long enough now to have seen the difference. I've known those who have been like fire rockets. They flare into the sky with an impressive display only to plummet to the earth like a burnt stick. And some of them used to belong to this congregation. And they have sung of their love for Jesus with an intensity which would move you to tears. But they've never sought what Paul prays for, you see, patience and endurance. For then the means of fortifying those kind of qualities, like Bible study, like regular church attendance, like witnessing and prayer, have been too much of a drag. And yet this is where the power of God is to be found, says Paul. And I've seen it. I've seen it with those who have taken it seriously, who have been able to face whatever life throws at them, whether it be unemployment or sickness, or bereavement, or divorce, or persecution. And they have done so with a deep joy in the midst of their tears, giving thanks to God the Father, (laughs) verse 12. Why? Well, because they know they've got a Savior who has rescued them at great cost, and nothing, nothing will be able to rob them of that inheritance. So here, then, is a model for and a challenge to our praying. Will you pray for each other like this? Will you pray for me like this? Because I do pray for you like this. We all need gratitude arising out of the gospel, a way of thinking shaped by the gospel, a way of life directed by the gospel, and empowered by the gospel. And it will be through gospel praying that they will be made real. So let us pray now. Our great God and Heavenly Father, we pray that you would fill us with the knowledge of your will, which is consisting of wisdom and understanding that the Holy Spirit gives so that we may live lives worthy of the Lord Jesus, that we would please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in knowledge of you, being strengthened with all power according to your glorious might, so that we may have great endurance and patience, and that we would give joyful thanks to you, our Father, because you've qualified us to share in the inheritance of your holy people in the kingdom of light. Amen.